Good morning, everyone. Wow, what a great day to be together, to come together in the sanctuary here and also with you folks watching online. We are so happy to be together to praise and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? All right. Well, my name is Kathy Dorman, and I'm bringing you an announcement this morning and some information from our administrative council. This last week, um, well, first of all, a couple of things. I want to say thank you to all of those that participated over these last many months um, on our reopening task force. We were uh, charged with developing the protocols for safety and procedures and things that we were following here at church through the pandemic. And they've worked very diligently and met and prayerfully considered a lot of things. And this last week we met again and we took some recommendations to the Administrative Council which were affirmed on Wednesday. And so I want to bring you that information. So as of today, and some of you have already gotten this memo, obviously, uh, face coverings, masks, are now optional here in the building for all activities at Central Trinity. Now, there's a broad spectrum of thought about that, and we want to make sure that any and everyone that still feels comfortable wearing a face covering or a mask, that we affirm that. We, we love y'all, no matter what, mask, no mask, but that, uh, you know, we will, that is the, the protocol right now is that masks are optional. So if, you want, if you'd like to wear a mask into the building and come into your seat in the sanctuary and take your mask off, that's fine. If you want to keep it on, that's fine. Uh, so we will honor and understand whatever your decisions are regarding that. Then a couple of other things coming. We've set just a couple of dates, milestones that we're going to be looking at. Starting on Sunday, June the 6th, the sanctuary is going to come back to a more pre-pandemic look. The blue bands on the seating will be gone. The pew Bibles and the hymnals would be back in the, in the pews. Um, at this point in time, though, we are not going to be passing offering plates or passing anything. So there will be, um, we're not going to pass out bulletins. There will be some on a stand in the back of the sanctuary. You can pick one up. The offering boxes are going to remain for right now. And communion is going to continue as it has been these last few months in that prepackaged form and will be handed to you as you come in. And so communion in June is actually going to be celebrated the second Sunday of June. So when you come in June and July, and then we're going to go from there and we'll figure it out. So we just ask for your patience and understanding and as we continue to advance down uh, this avenue and uh, this exciting time of kind of bringing things uh, back to normal. Uh, which is a word I'm not even sure we know what that means anymore. So, and then come July 4th, so we set the first Sunday in June, the first Sunday in July is when we're kind of opening things back up to any group in the church, Sunday school group, service group, um, Verla Moore, UMW, Men's Breakfast, you know, any groups that are within the church to be able to have that time of fellowship and food, which as Methodists we love to have. So. Um, the smaller group settings, we're going to give that a green light, and you can have your snacks and coffee and things like that. Um, I don't see us coming back to like a full-blown church dinner, potluck kind of thing. Maybe in the fall, uh, we'll see that. But any of the smaller church groups that want to get together and start sharing that fellowship and food, that's going to happen starting in July. And the traditional service, this particular service, is going to continue at 10.30. Um, it's been a good time all through this, and that's also going to allow us to continue doing the cleaning. We will continue from safety standpoint to clean the sanctuary and do all of that uh, that we are doing right now between the two services. So those are the announcements about the protocols and the reopening, and it's an exciting time. And so it's just wonderful to, to be able to embrace this and we'll move forward. And if things change, then they'll change, and, you know, and we'll just keep you informed. So every week you get an email, those of you that have an email from the church, you get an, an email blast with bulletins and announcements and things like that. It's also going to be in the church newsletter. And if we need to communicate something in a more urgent way, we will do that. But uh, just keep an eye out for those, uh, that ongoing information 
uh, in the newsletter. Okay, and I was asked to make one other announcement since I was coming up here this morning to remind you all that this Sunday, next Sunday, our, our two Sundays, last two Sundays with Pastor Steve and the family, and so this, particular, this week, um, as you leave the sanctuary, we're going to have a reception out in the Welcome Center area for them. It's going to be a little bit of a distance. Everything's prepackaged, though. We didn't want to let uh, this special time around the Judson family go by without some recognition. So those of you, as you're leaving, some of you may just want to stay in your seats a little while, and then we'll go through. There's not going to be like an official receiving line, per se, but Steve and the family will be out there and you can give them uh, your well wishes and grab a cookie and enjoy a little bit of time together. So um, all of that being said, I think Steve, there you go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all. For the kind of gathering and fellowship and we'll be kind of wandering around so there won't be a formal greeting receiving, but we'll just be, our family will be present. And as Kathy uh, mentioned, there will be some prepackaged items uh, snacks and drinks that you're able to pick up if you would like as a part of that time of fellowship. I also want to share a quick announcement about Eastside Community Ministries, which is a, 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 a parachurch faith-based organization many of you are familiar with, just about a block and a half from CT. Over the last uh, couple of years, we've begun a, a really neat relationship, uh, kind of uh, looking toward a, more of a partnership with uh, Eastside uh, in the coming years. We had been working toward that in the pandemic kind of set things back for a little while, um, but uh, we had something in the Connect recently about opportunities to volunteer. They also are having, a, over the summer, July 19th and 20th, they're having a girls camp, an overnight, and 21st and 22nd, a boys camp, and so if there's anyone that might feel led to be a part of that, uh, and it could be just a, an hour or something where you might give some help, uh, Desi Craig is their youth director. Uh, and you can call the office. I'll be here over the next week. Uh, and then Desi is over at Eastside. We've been working with both Desi and Jamie Trout, the executive director over at Eastside, uh, and very excited about future possibilities. Uh, they are also saying, and maybe there's someone that'd like to learn a little bit more about Eastside before they get any further than that, and they'd like to come in when we have a dinner or a breakfast over one of these two gatherings, these uh, overnight camps as well, and that might be a possibility. But we'll, you'll hear more about that in coming months about that uh, relationship and about opportunities to serve. They have about 30 or 40 uh, youth and children and their families that they're connected to in our community. And so uh, it's just been neat to see how that um, has, has continued to sort of blossom a little bit. Well, uh, with that, I would invite us to a moment of prayer as we open our time of worship together. Uh, dear Lord and our God, we are so grateful for this beautiful day. Uh, Lord, we are thankful for the opportunity to be together. Uh, and Lord, uh, for those who are watching online also to be together with us. Uh, Lord, we pray your blessing upon this time. May your Holy Spirit rest upon it and upon each of us. Lord, may it be a wonderful opportunity for, our, for us to exchange our praise and our love and gratitude to you. And Lord, to receive your presence and be encouraged and inspired by it. Lord, we ask your blessing on this time. We pray that it would be pleasing to you and an inspiration to us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Good morning, church. Our opening hymn this morning can be found on page 600, Wonderful Words of Life. We will sing verses 1, 2, and 3. Would you please stand and join me? Would you please remain standing for our Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father. It was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. This morning is Pentecost. It's the day in the church calendar that we remember when Jesus sent his Holy Spirit to give power to the new believers, to give them that power to shine his light out into the world and to live their lives fully the way he intended. And that power, that's still available to us today. That Holy Spirit, that same Holy Spirit is available to us as believers. So to this morning, I brought a flashlight to help us understand how important the Holy Spirit is to us. What do you think will happen if I push this button on the back of the flashlight? It'll turn on, right? It's not working. Why do you think it isn't working? Let's check. You're right. It's empty inside. There are no batteries inside. Do you think it's important for a flashlight to have batteries inside? Of course, right? The batteries give it the power it needs to shine its light. Now, batteries, even though they're not a living person like the Holy Spirit, batteries remind me of the Holy Spirit because just like batteries would help this flashlight have power to shine its light, the Holy Spirit gives us as believers the power to shine Jesus' light out into the world. Without the Holy Spirit in us, we're like this empty flashlight, without the power that we need. The Bible says that without the Holy Spirit, we can't love others very well. And without the Holy Spirit, we aren't able to fully live the life that God has for us, to do all that he has planned all the wonderful things he has in store for us. But what's going to happen if I put these batteries back in? Now, when I push the button, that's a pretty bright light. Now the flashlight can shine its light out into the world, and that's what we want for ourselves. We want the Holy Spirit to fill us with his light so that we can, with his power, so that we can shine his light out into the world. So this week, pray and ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit so that you can shine his light out into the world. Our prayer hymn this morning can be found on page 420. Breathe on me, breath of God. We will sing verses 1 and 3. Fill me 
as we spend a few moments in prayer this morning, I would like to lift up a couple of prayer requests and a praise. Uh, one, uh, please hold Barb Ball in your prayers. Uh, she had uh, uh, went to a regular doctor's appointment this week, and, and her heart was out of rhythm in AFib. So they are working to try to get that back into rhythm. So please hold Barb in your prayers. Um, and then also, um, Sandy McCutcheon last weekend was in the hospital. So please hold uh, Sandy McCutcheon in your prayers, her ongoing kind of treatments and, and battle with the uh, blood cancer. Uh, and then uh, a, a, a Joy, Amanda and Bryce Cooper, had uh, sh Amanda had a C-section Friday, and a new little one came into the world. So, uh, and girl, right? I thought that it was girl. It would be really bad to say the wrong gender um, <laughs> and, and be out on the airwaves, too. So uh, uh, we give praise to God and celebrate with Amanda and Bryce uh, and the addition to their family. Well, as we go into a time of prayer, uh, this is a time where we can spend in God's presence uh, however we feel led, lifting up prayers, lifting up praise and gratitude to God, uh, and then I will lift up a corporate prayer on our behalf and invite us into the Lord's Prayer. So please be encouraged to take this time to just spend in the presence of God. May we pray. God, thank you for the knowledge that when we pray, you hear. When we enter into your presence, even, uh, Lord, quietly, you are with us. Uh, and Lord, when we lift up our praise to you, our gratitude, you rejoice. Um, God, hear the prayers that have been placed before you, even uh, by all of us here individually. God, hear also uh, these prayers and praise corporately. We lift up Barb uh, Ball for your care. We commend also Sandy McCutcheon to your care. In both cases, God, asking for healing, for wholeness, and for peace. God, we thank you and give you praise for Amanda and Bryce Cooper's uh, new little girl and joining uh, uh, a son to make this family now of four. We give you thanks and praise and pray your blessing upon uh, this family, and upon this wonderful, blessed uh, little addition to it. God, we lift all that is on our hearts, minds, and spirits to you, knowing that you are able to work far more powerfully, far more abundantly, uh, Lord, than anyone, anything, any, uh, uh, anywhere. You uh, can provide, and you love us, and we're grateful for that. Be with us as we move through this time of transition in upcoming weeks. We pray, Lord, that your hand would continue to be on this place and the light that we seek to shine through the power of the Holy Spirit to our community and world. Lord, may we uh, Lord, uh, use the legacy of this church to launch us into the future, but God, looking ahead to how you will continue to work as we follow you. And Lord, we thank you in these moments and where we kind of almost feel you a little more present when we come to you together in prayer. We lift up this prayer, uh, Lord, that you taught your earliest followers to pray, and we now join together to do so also. May we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Yeah, I'll worship your holy name. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You have no rival. You have no People of God said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, ladies. Well, this is Pentecost Sunday. I realized last week that I had worn my red shirt on Communion Sunday two weeks ago, and then last week I wore it later in the day to the district event, and I said, Am I allowed to wear it that often? <laughs> well, what are you going to put a purple shirt on? on uh, now, those of you who have a purple shirt, you look wonderful. Um, <laughs> I'm talking about as the pastor, okay? Shouldn't have said in color, should I? Um, and and it, is, uh, it is Pentecost Sunday, and uh, I'm going to be sharing the story of Pentecost and then sharing from that as the basis of my message. So uh, Acts chapter 2 and verses 1 through 21, uh, my Bible titles it, The Holy Spirit Comes at Pentecost. Hear this from the Word of God. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing, the rushing of a violent and mighty wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be like tongues of fire that separated and came down to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because one each other heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't these all, all Galileans who are speaking? How is it that each of us hears it in our own language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, 
Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonder of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, ah, oh, they've had too much wine. <laughs> and then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, some pessimist, uh, referring to Pentecost, once said that if it were up to many Christians today, uh, a lot of churches would put lightning rods on top of the church instead of crosses, remembering the day so long ago on Pentecost when the Holy Spirit, like lightning, struck the church and wanting to make sure that nothing like that ever happens to them. <laughs> and so on the day of Pentecost, which literally means 50th day, and was the 50th day after Jesus had been raised from the dead by the power of God, lightning did indeed strike the early church. They were gathered in an upper room in Jerusalem. All the original 12 of Jesus' closest followers that we know of as the disciples, except for Judas, who had been replaced by a man named Matthias. Jesus' brothers and mother were also there, and quite a few other close friends and followers of Jesus. And so we have this ragtag band of faithful, earnest believers still shaken by the events of the past 50 days, saddened by the departure of their leader, Jesus, who has now returned to God the Father in what we Christians know of as the ascension, literally rising in the air until he could be seen no more, but promising one day to return which is good news for us, but sad for those earliest followers of Jesus. They were uncertain as to what their future in that time held in the absence of their leader. Yeah, Jesus had told them to wait for a while, and that's exactly what they did. They waited, and they prayed. They waited, and they prayed. And then without warning, lightning struck. Not literally, of course, but, but figuratively. The Bible says suddenly a sound like the blowing, the rush of a mighty wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then what seemed to be like tongues of fire began to come and rest on each one there. They were filled with the Holy Spirit of God and began to speak in other tongues, other languages, as the Spirit enabled them. I wonder sometimes what would happen if God decided to lay his Spirit on us in this place in a way that was just kind of foreign, uh, different than what we were expecting, than maybe what we, would use, we were used to. What might happen? So often we think, uh, uh, we, we, I think we as Christians sort of figure that we know how God operates. Well, I mean, we would never say it that way, uh, but sometimes we act that way, you know, maybe to try to stop something that God is doing that maybe isn't the way that we've always done it before, not something that we're not used to, uh, and so it must, you know, not be right. I heard a story once about a very dignified pastor who was visiting one of his homebound folks in a long-term care facility, a nursing home, the woman that he was visiting was confined to a wheelchair. And so at the end of his visit, he was sort of getting up and getting ready to leave. And, and, and she said, Pastor, would you pray for me? And so he, he, he prayed for her and he asked God to be with her and to bring her comfort and strength and, and even healing. When he finished the prayer, her face began to glow. There was something different about her. She said, Pastor, w would you help me to my feet? I think I can stand. Not knowing what else to do, he, he helped her up. 
At first she took a few uncertain steps, but then she began to kind of jump a little and, and skip a little bit. And then she began to even dance a little bit and to shout and cry with happiness, amazed at what God had just done in her body until the whole nursing home was sort of filled with excitement and amazement. Well, after she calmed down, this very solemn pastor hurried out to the car, quickly closed the door, grabbed hold of the steering wheel, and prayed this little prayer. Lord, don't you ever do that to me again. <laughs> and whether we want to admit it or not, we so often expect so little out of God. And sometimes even out of fear or, or just resistance, we might even push back when God is working in some amazing and wonderful way that is just maybe not what we're used to. What if the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, like lightning, began to strike in really wonderful ways in our lives and in our church? Well, I think he already has. But what if we began to see things a little, that, uh, you know, a little differently than what we're used to, or maybe something that stretched our imagination a little bit of the way that we think that God operates? Would we be willing to trust him in the midst of it? Or might we resist it a little bit if it pushes us beyond where we're comfortable. A couple of years or so ago, I shared a message on, I won't ask you the main points, uh, on three signs of uh, a, a vital, vibrant, life-giving, community-impacting church. And there were three signs that I said, and one of them was that it was powered by the Holy Spirit, and then the, other, uh, the second one was its trademark was love, or is love, and then the third one is its message is Jesus Christ. And I want to talk a little bit about that first point uh, that I had in that message a few years ago, what it looks like to be powered by the Holy Spirit, what it looks like for a great work of God, the, the Holy Spirit of God, uh, and it could be in an individual's life, in the life of a church, or maybe a workplace, or, or community. And, and I think we could probably come up with a few, with, with a few but I'm, I've got three that I think are absolutely evident and a sign of a great work of the Holy Spirit of God, a great work of God. And I'm going to give them to you and then come back and talk about them one by one. And, and, and I'm going to just title them Presence, Power, and Vision. Presence, Power, and Vision. And the first characteristic of a great work of God, the Holy Spirit, is His presence among us. Let's look again at verses 1 through 4 of this passage. It says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing, the rush, I mean, I almost think of like a storm, this kind of came through that place, filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be like tongues of fire that sort of separated and were uh, resting upon each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, and began to speak in other tongues, other languages, as the Spirit enabled them. And you heard the rest of the story then, that the people began to hear the message of Christ in their own language, miraculously, through what God had done. And this is all because the presence of God's Spirit came upon them. The Holy Spirit came upon them in a powerful um, and, and, and mighty and, and even miraculous, even supernatural way. You see, God can't do a whole lot through us if the Spirit isn't present in us. When, when Jesus ascended prior to, to Pentecost, when he went back to heaven to be with God the Father, the followers felt like sheep without a shepherd. They felt like followers without a leader. Now, Jesus had told them not to worry. He had said that, I'm going to send you a counselor, an advocate, a helper to be with you forever. But that helper came like a bolt of lightning, like a mighty wind, like tongues of fire on that day of Pentecost. You see, the Holy Spirit is Christ's presence, God's presence in the heart of his followers. Why, even the people of ancient Israel were commanded to carry fire with them as they traveled with Moses to the Promised Land. And you may remember that the, the cloud that led them by night was bright like fire. We still use fire to symbolize the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, the, uh, the, the candles that we light uh, before worship are symbolic of the presence, the Holy Spirit, uh, in this place with us. Uh, even the symbol of the United Methodist Church, the cross and flame, the flame represents the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so these tongues of fire that the Bible says rested upon each of the believers on the day of Pentecost, really, as, as Kiffin alluded to a little bit ago, 
was that same fire. And that same fire is available for us and in our lives even today as followers of Christ. We are not alone. God is with us. God has given us too a counselor, a helper, an advocate. God has not left us hanging. God has not left us powerless. And if we receive that forgiveness for sin, which Jesus died on the cross to make possible and entered into a relationship with, with God, then we bear that flame, that same flame which rested upon the believers at the day of Pentecost uh, is within us as well. And so in order to experience a great work of God, a great work of, of the Holy Spirit, it, it, the presence of God, the presence of the Spirit has to be a part of our lives. Well, the second character, everything sort of builds on that. So then the second characteristic of a great work of the Holy Spirit of God, in addition to his presence, is his power. Jesus, in his final instructions to his disciples, his closest followers, right before that ascension, right before he went back to be with God the Father uh, in, in, uh, in heaven, it says in Luke 24 and verse 49, Jesus told them to wait in Jerusalem, quote, until you have been clothed with power from on high. So in other words, Jesus is saying, something's going to come. You wait, and a power like you had never seen before is going to rest and be a part of you. And that power Jesus was referring to was the power of God's Holy Spirit, which really was what we often refer to as the beginning of the church, uh, 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 the, the, the infilling of the Holy Spirit uh, for followers of Christ. And so on that day of Pentecost, the 50th day after Jesus was raised from the dead, and 10 days after the Bible tells us that he left earth to go back to be with God the Father, that power became evident. It was unleashed as Peter is preaching the message of Jesus. Well, it was unleashed to those in that room, but then it really begins to be unleashed. In verse 41 of Acts chapter 2, uh, Peter is preaching. He's talking about Jesus and what Jesus came to the world to make uh, possible. Uh, and and th this, this forgiveness for sin. And, and like 3,000 people came to faith in Christ in one day. So in this relatively brief period of history, this new burgeoning movement is spreading across the entire Roman Empire. And that was even in the midst of a whole bunch of persecution that was occurring as well uh, to those who had chosen Jesus, who had recognized Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So power was promised and power was delivered. When the presence and power of the Holy Spirit is experienced, people walk with courage and confidence. Not arrogance. I mean, we're, not talk, we're talking, also talking about humility and a, and a peaceable, peaceable spirit, so not arrogant, but courageous and confident, even in the midst of uncertainty. And it's in those times when we, as, as followers of Christ, as God's people, are reminded uh, that nothing is impossible for those who are being led by God. Nothing is impossible. Friends, everyone who enters into a relationship with God uh, by receiving the forgiveness for their sins that Jesus uh, died to make possible has the Spirit of God living in them. So it's not like you have half the Spirit or two-thirds of the Spirit. You either have the Spirit or you don't. However, the more you develop your relationship with God, through, through what we call the spiritual disciplines, prayer, uh, Bible reading and, and study, spending time in the community of faith, uh, serving and reaching out uh, in the name of Christ in our community and world, and, and, and other uh, activities as well, uh, you, you open yourself up to a greater experience of the presence of God, the power of God, the Holy Spirit of God in your life. And sometimes Christians wonder why uh, their lives are mediocre or why their faith experience just doesn't seem to maybe be all that. Maybe it's because you've allowed the presence of God through a relationship with Christ to come into your life, but you haven't gone deeper to receive the power of God that is available, the power of the Holy Spirit of God. A certain husband uh, was wanting to cheer up his, his wife who was not feeling well. And so he thought, yeah, I'm going to bake her some bread. Oh, she loves some fresh baked bread. 
And so he gathered all the ingredients, he put them on the counter, he laid out flour and shortening and milk and yeast and whatever all else goes into bread, because I can't say I've ever cooked any. Uh, and, but he misplaced the directions. And so he put several packets of yeast into this little loaf of bread. Um, after all, he reasoned, if a little yeast is good, a lot of yeast must be great. So a little while later, his wife hollers from upstairs, Hey, honey, is the bread in the oven? And the distraught husband cried out, In the oven? I can't even keep it in the kitchen! <laughs> but that's reflective of what our lives look like as we deepen and develop our relationship with God. The Holy Spirit just kind of flows out and we begin to deal with things and, and, and handle things and see God working in wonderful ways. But we've got to open ourselves up to the power by really uh, developing that relationship uh, with, with God. Okay, so the presence of God and the power of God. The third characteristic of a great work of the Holy Spirit of God uh, is just what I'm going to call vision. A vision that comes from God. Basically a vision of where God is leading us, where God wants to take us. So presence, power, and then vision. Now, when those earliest followers of Jesus, who at Pentecost began speaking in all those different languages, began being harassed by a few people who said that they must be drunk, I mean, what did Peter respond by saying? Well, first he says, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning, all right? So probably not likely that we've all, you know, already have been drinking. But, but then he starts quoting the Old Testament prophet Joel. And, and he says in verses 16 and following, you see, friends, this is what Joel was talking about back a long time ago when he said, In the last days, God has declared that I will pour out my Spirit on all people, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. And he goes on talking about this day, this, this vision of a new day when God will operate a little differently than ever before. And his point was that God was doing something new. It wasn't going to be about following, you know, it, the, the, it wasn't like the Old Testament law just sort of disappeared, but he was saying, that's, I, got, I got a better way to really connect you to, to me, God says, and, and you know, through, through Jesus. So the former way of doing things, the, the way things have always been done, are going to look a little bit different. Uh, it, it was going to be about following God's Holy Spirit, no matter where it leads us, no matter what it guides, guides us to do. Now, I will say that the Bible, the Word of God, still uh, is the parameters, the boundaries, uh, but within those parameters, the sky's the limit. And God wants to work in wonderful and even miraculous ways to accomplish His will in and through our lives, our church, and our world. You see, the reality is that God did start working in a new and different way at Pentecost, a way that the people had never seen before. And they were challenged to recognize that while it looked very different, it was also definitely from God. Now that message could be applied many ways in, in our lives, certainly can be applied in many ways in our life together as the body of Christ, the church. But if we want to see the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, to the greatest extent possible working in our lives, in our church, and in our world, we must be open to, we must desire, and even embrace the power, the presence, uh, and the vision of God's Holy Spirit. See, without all three of those, presence, power, and vision, we will never experience the f what I would call the fullness of God's Holy Spirit as those early believers experienced it on the day of Pentecost. But be prepared. If you genuinely seek to develop the presence, the power, and seek God's vision in your lives, like a mighty violent wind, it may challenge you a little bit at times. It may move your dire directions that are not necessarily what you have been accustomed to. It might be a little unsettling at times, maybe even a little scary. But it will also amaze you. It will bless you. It will allow you to accomplish great things from God. And you will grow stronger and stronger in your faith. So pray for it, desire it, expect it, and when it comes, receive it. The presence, 
the power and the vision of the Holy Spirit of God. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful that when you sent your Holy Spirit, your presence in a visible way at Pentecost into your people, those earliest followers of Christ, those earliest believers, Lord, we are grateful that that same outpouring of your presence, your power, and your vision is available to us today. God, may we seek to open ourselves up. I pray, Lord, that every single person in the sound of my voice has received that presence by receiving Jesus Christ into their lives as Lord and Savior. And I pray, God, that all of us are seeking to develop that power so that we might experience in, in all that we face in our lives. And God, to catch your vision for our lives, our, our church, our world, as we seek you fully. God, may that be our heartfelt desire. And by your grace, may you grant it. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn this morning can be found on page 384, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. We will sing verses 1 through 4. Would you please stand and join me?
Well, as you leave this place, know uh, that you do not go alone. That the power, the presence, and the vision of God's Holy Spirit that has been made possible to you through your relationship with Christ, and as you develop and deepen uh, and seek to draw nearer uh, to God, to Christ, in that relationship, goes with you. And so you face nothing alone. May that encourage us uh, as we leave this place, no matter what we face in this coming week, the presence, the power, and the vision of God go with you. Have a wonderful and blessed week, and we hope to see you again soon. God bless. Thank you.